Hey, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm just going to mute everybody. Okay, uh, as always, thank you to Miriam Friedman for doing her utmost to keep me on task and it keep, keeps me on task as much as it's possible for someone to keep me on task and for keeping on uh, suggesting wonderful topics and, and uh, for being a clearinghouse for people to put in questions. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Miriam, very, very much. Uh, the topic for this evening, and thank you to each of, uh, each of you for joining us, the topic for this evening is halachos involving tovaling and pasharing. Now, I just want to give us an introduction. There's a common misunderstanding regarding the relationship between tovaling and kashering. Are they synonyms? Do they serve the same function, different functions? Tovaling and kashering are very different halachos, very, very different halachos. Um, both of them, by the way, are based on verses in the Torah. Uh, tovaling, there's halacha that if a vessel belonged to a non-Jew, a food-oriented vessel belonged to a non-Jew and now is owned by a Jew. A Jew has a mitzvah to tovel, to immerse this vessel in a mikvah before using it. Okay, that's even if the non-Jew never used the item. It has nothing to do with if the non-Jew used it for kosher food or didn't use it for kosher food or used it or didn't use it at all. It has nothing to do with any of that. It's a Torah halacha. If a non-Jew owns a food utensil and then a Jew takes ownership of it, the Jew needs to tovel it first. Kashering is something very, very different. Kashering is if a vessel was used for non-kosher food, regardless if it was used for non-kosher food by a non-Jew, by a Jew, a Jew who intentionally used it for non-kosher food, a Jew who mistakenly used it for non-kosher food, whatever, there's an absorption of non-kosher taste within the vessel, if let's say it was used with heat, and normally we say it has to be purged. The vessel has to be kashered to, to sort of bring out, uh, expel the absorbed taste within the vessel. So kashering and tovaling are very, very different. Um, the vast majority of tonight's questions, and thank you everybody for submitting questions, the vast majority of tonight's questions have to do with tovaling. Um, as we always do, I'm gonna go through the questions First, if you have any questions on anything that we've spoken about, or very likely other questions sort of are sparked in your mind, um, please feel free to put it in the chat. Once I go through all the questions that have already been submitted, uh, then we'll transition over to the questions from the chat. If you're not comfortable putting questions in the chat, don't worry. Uh, at the very end, for anyone who still holds the patience to stay with us, uh, we give the opportunity to anyone who would like to call out questions also, also if you'd like. Okay, not in a specific order, hopefully a little bit organized, but uh, question, look, without further ado, question number one. This is a very good question. What do you do if you have been using a vessel for many years that hasn't been toveled and it's awkward to take it and tovel it? So, there could be many vessels that one is obligated to tovel that one just didn't realize they were obligated to tovel it. So the halacha is, even if you've used it for years, um, you still need to tovel it. In other words, the fact that it's currently owned by a Jew, currently used by a Jew, doesn't exempt it from being immersed if it was originally owned earlier, owned by a non-Jew. Um, the one part that you really have to, that's going to make it a little bit more difficult is uh, in some sense similar to how people use the mikvah. Um, there's a halach of chatzitza, of uh, barriers uh, with items that you're toveling also. So really, to whatever extent possible, a person really needs to make sure their item really is clean. Uh, so obviously, as we all know, certain types of utensils, especially if it has certain types of gaps in it, uh, certain um, ridges and, and the like, uh, it might be very difficult to clean appropriately. Obviously, that could be a shail in its own right, you know, if it's clean enough uh, to, to tovel. But uh, the fact that someone has used it for years and then realizes they should tovel it does not exempt them from toveling it. Still, it's appropriate to tovel it. Um, this is going to come up in other ways, but I want to make this very clear already now. You're not allowed to cook with a vessel, if, if the vessel requires tefillah, you're not allowed to cook with something that hasn't been toveled. You're not allowed to eat with something that hasn't been toveled. 
but that doesn't render the food prohibited to eat. In other words, if I have a frying pan that I was supposed to tovel, and I didn't tovel it, you know, none of us are perfect. For whatever reason, I didn't tovel it. Uh, if, and, I, and I fried eggs in that pan, and then all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, I thought I was going to tovel it, and I never did. The eggs are still perfectly fine to eat. I, I just, before I do anything more with the pan, I should tovel it. Okay, that's question number one. Um, question number two is a very important question. May one eat at a family member or a friend's house if you're pretty sure they didn't tovel their dishes, uh, they're, 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 they didn't tovel their utensils. Um, that's complicated. Follow-up question, what if they toveled some of their stuff? Do you have to sit there and start ask, asking what they did tovel, what they didn't tovel? So let me, let me first deal with this conceptually and then maybe we'll try to talk a little bit practically. Conceptually speaking, if a Jew has a vessel that's obligated in Tila, um, another Jew is not allowed to use that vessel until it's toveled. In other words, if I'm a guest in your home and there are dishes that you're supposed to tovel and you haven't, even though it's your mitzvah to tovel, it's not my mitzvah to tovel, but I'm not allowed to use it until you tovel the dishes or the vessels, whatever it is. Um, there's a lot of discussion. I'll, there's discussion in the post game. Again, obviously, if this is really relevant to a person, I'd, I'd encourage you to uh, you know discuss this offline. But um, I just want to give an example for a second. Think of a, a soup bowl, okay? You're not able to eat that soup unless you have a bowl. You, 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 you couldn't, forgive my example, you couldn't get away with doing it, cupping it in your hands. It's not going to work, right? Um, contrast that with taking a small plate and having a brownie on a small plate. I mean, maybe it's more polite to, to you know, to be, uh, to eat, have the brownie on a plate, but I could eat the brownie just fine, you know, without the plate. So there could be some discussion as to what's really called really essential for eating or not. But the bottom line is, if I'm a guest in someone's home and it's clear to me that they haven't told all their things, that's a real issue. That's a real issue if I'm allowed to, it's actually not an issue regarding if I'm allowed to eat the food they made with dishes that weren't tovled. That's not a problem. I mean, it's a problem that they didn't tovel their, their cooking utensils, but it's not a problem for the food. But the act of eating, if the, if the utensils that I'm using uh, haven't been toveled, that's a problem for me. Uh, how do you deal practically with this in terms of what are you supposed to do? Like send someone a questionnaire before you, you accept an invitation from them, you know, please check the following boxes. You know, uh, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I think it's, I think it's fair to assume the same way, whatever we, you know, whatever general assessment we make of a person in terms of feeling that we can rely on them for kashras and stuff like that. Um, uh, you know, I, I think if we feel that, to the best of our knowledge, a person is a lucky observant person, you know, Shomer Shabbos, Kashras, et cetera, I think we can assume that, unless proven otherwise, we assume they keep all of halacha appropriately. Um, if it becomes clear in conversation that they don't tovel things, um, then I think it probably makes sense to be asking some questions. Um, I think so. It's a good question. Um, okay. This is a really interesting question and it takes a lot of people for a loop. May I tovel someone else's Kalim without telling them? So, so let's, just, uh, let's just try to give a very, very common scenario. This happens a lot actually. Um, I, I decide I want to give you a housewarming gift. So I find a very nice uh, serving tray and I decide I want to give it to you as a gift. And then, I'm gonna, this is really a full service gift. I take it to the mikvah and I tovel it for you. So I give you a gift and I tell you and, 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 and it's been toveled and everything. So actually, um, that's actually discouraged in halacha. It's a little bit surprising. Um, the idea is that the context in which a person tovels, it's the idea of toveling is supposed to be as a means of using the item. So if my relationship with this item 
is I'm giving it to you as a gift. So it's, I'm not really toveling it to use it. So the generally accepted approach in halacha, I, I'm, I'm not saying everyone has to run out and retovel all their stuff, but, 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 the, but, but certainly like moving forward, the generally accepted approach is that it's most appropriate for the owner to be the one to tovel it. Um, that, that, uh, that would seem to make sense. Um, I, I've sometimes had the conversation with someone, forgive me if this sounds really weird, but sometimes people have asked me, if I go to the store and buy something, you know, you're allowed to buy something and have in mind that you're acquiring it for the person in the store. You know what I mean? In other words, it's, it's actually, for anyone who comes to, you know, Simchas at the Shul, you'll frequently hear me say, I acquired this safer for the bar about mitzvah, you know, before Shabbos. So I could go to the store and when I buy it, I could say, I'm buying this for, you know, Bob. I, I can have that in mind when I'm acquiring it. So then it's really Bob's. So then essentially you could call Bob up and ask, I bought something for you. It's yours. May I be your proxy to tovel it? In other words, the owner can appoint a proxy to tovel something. I know that sounds a little strange, but absent that, it seems the pretty well accepted halachic approach is if you're getting a gift for someone, you should not tovel it uh, before giving it to them. That that that's the pretty uh, standard approach. Okay. Um, okay. The next question is is a wonderful follow up on this question. So it's many times, particularly, you know, in, in, in the gift stores, you know, like candy stores and things like that, if you really want to get a nice, a nice gift for a person, um, you know, that my children would say, if you want to get a nice gift for a person, get them candy. But even the next step up is when you get them candy, you can get them candy in a nice dish. And so then you come and you're bringing this dish with candy in it. Now, the obvious question is, well, wait a second. This is like a kosher store. So was the, was the, was the gift tray toveled already or not? So based on what we just said, it really wouldn't be appropriate for the gift tray to be toveled, right? So somebody gave you this gift of this tray that hasn't been toveled yet which means you're not supposed to use it until you tovel it, except this tray is full of candy. And they hand it to you and they say, here, use this tray for dessert today. What am I, what, huh? You know, so what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to empty it? Am I not supposed to empty it? So there's a, there's a very common leniency held that basically... That I think a certain extent it fits into that distinction we were making before. You're really not eating with that tray. You, you know what I mean? So the bottom line is the commonly held thing is that first use, you can get away without toveling it. In other words, you could use it as to serve your dessert without toveling it that first time because it's not even possible to tovel it at the beginning because it's full of this food. But then before using it a subsequent time, you're supposed to tovel it. That, that's, that's the commonly, and what it would mean is you could keep on using it until the contents of the tray were used up. And then once the contents of the tray are used up, then you should tovel the item. The owner, recipient of the gift, should tovel the item. Okay. Does one have to tovel pots from Israel, Israel that were probably not made in Israel? Very, very interesting question. Let's just get context for this. We mentioned at the beginning of the at the beginning of the of the discussion that if an item is owned by a non-Jew and now ownership is transferred to a Jew, the Jew has to tovel it before using it. Now let's say you buy the item in Israel. Well, who produced this item? So it's a Judaic item bought in Israel. But if you read the fine print, many of those Judaic items bought in Israel were made in Hong Kong or China or, or, or wherever, um, in, in, in which case, 
presumably it was under non-Jewish ownership when it was first made, in which case you would have to tovel it. If, on the other hand, it was it was made under Jewish ownership, then uh, y- you certainly shouldn't have to tovel it. Um, a lot of times on appliances and, and, and utensils and the like that are made in, in a Jewish setting or Israel, there's, there's a little note on the box itself that says, uh, you know, it doesn't need tefillah. Uh, and the context of that frequently, not all the time, but frequently is because it was made by Jews, it was owned by Jews from its inception. Um, so, but absent, absent knowledge of that, I don't think you can say that just because you bought it in Israel, you could assume it's always been under Jewish ownership. I think without indication as such, I'd be, I mean, the, like we said, the mitzvah of toveling is from the Torah. Um, I'd be wary of using it without toveling it. I'd also be wary of making a bracha because it's distinctly possible to own by Jew the whole way through. But um, I think it probably makes sense to tovel those kind of things without a bracha, unless there's indication that it was uh, really produced by a Jew. I know it sounds strange, but I just think there's so many things you buy in Israel that really weren't made under under Jewish auspices, under Jewish ownership. Okay. Um, Totally changing gears. What about oven grates for a new oven? Okay, now let's let's think about this um, a little bit. So, what type of vessels need to be toveled in the first place? So let's set out a few, a few, a few principles. So one, one principle is that it has to be something that comes in direct contact with food. If it doesn't even, if the vessel doesn't even come in direct contact with food, you shouldn't have to tovel it, generally speaking. Another significant principle is what is it used for? So the classic examples of what has to be toveled are the things that are used to make food or to eat food. On sort of a secondary level, things that are used to store or serve food could also be included in that list, but possibly a lower, a lower, uh, a lower plane. Um, there's another principle, it matters what the item is made of. So broadly speaking, if it's made of metal, glass, it needs to be toveled. Um, If it's made of plastic, generally speaking, it doesn't need to be toveled. Now, what about oven grates? Now, something that's mechuber lakarka, something that's attached to the ground, is not considered a cleave for these purposes, is not considered a a separate utensil, and you don't have to tovel it. So you don't have to uh, detach your oven, uh, you know, you know, and bring it to the mikvah. That's my leniency for the night. Uh, you don't have to do that. But the question is, what about the grates from the oven, uh, the racks from the oven? So I think the vast majority of the time, people, when people use the racks of the oven, food doesn't come in direct contact with the rack, at least not by design, right? Normally, you put your food in a pan or something, and you place the pan in the oven even if you sometimes are placing the food quote unquote directly on the racks, many times people will put a sheet of aluminum foil or something and put the food on top of that. So if I think most of us don't put food directly on oven racks, Uh, if you would put food directly on oven racks, I would say it would probably make sense to tovel the oven rack. But like I said, I think for most of us that that wouldn't be, uh, that wouldn't be relevant. Um, I would say, at the very least, we're going to talk about the broader toaster in a moment, but um, at the very least, I would say it would make sense to tovel uh, the rack of a toaster oven, right? You know, you know, it's there, you're putting food directly on it. Uh, It would certainly make sense to tovel that, that's for sure. Okay. Um, Toveling appliances, such as a Keurig or a microwave, or a handheld food processor. Okay, so let's let's start off um, making a distinction between appliances that are directly touching the food and that aren't directly touching the food. Okay, um, so a microwave. 
I, I don't think we should be talking about toveling a microwave. Um, we, we could talk about toveling the, um, the tray of a microwave, right? And that probably would make sense to tovel. Um, let's talk about a handheld food processor. Okay, that's coming in direct contact, but there's a big question about a food processor and many, many other appliances that come in direct contact with food. And there are two ways to say the question. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna start off in the sort of the Talmudic approach and then we'll shift gears, okay? The Talmudic approach is something that's an electric appliance that's plugged in. I mentioned to you already that something that's attached to the ground for these purposes is not considered to be a vessel. So you have this handheld appliance that, it, that looks like a vessel, feels like a vessel, but it's only impactful because it's plugged in. And since it's plugged in, you know, and, and that's, you know, it's kind of bound to the, to the electric grid, so to say. So does the fact that it's only usable if it's plugged in, does that give it a status as being mechubar lakarka, attached to the ground, so to say? So maybe if something is electric in, or plugged in, in nature, maybe that means you're exempt from totaling it in the first place. That's one way to view the discussion. The second way to view the discussion is a little bit more of a worldly way, which is to place both of one's hands on one's head and shriek and say, if I, if I take that electric appliance and immerse it in the mikvah, I'm gonna ruin the appliance. Those are both valid points and concerns. So how do we, how do we go about doing this? So broadly speaking, there are three opinions here. There is an opinion that says anything that's a plug-in appliance, you don't have to total. That's it. You don't have to total it. So that would be uh, a handheld food processor. That would be a water urn, right? Um, uh, that would, uh, I'm not remembering what the parts of the Keurig are, are, are. Well, the Keurig might be a little bit different, but that would be like the broader Keurig machine if there are, if, if the parts can't be taken, I just don't remember well. Um, that's one opinion. There's another opinion that says you're absolutely obligated to tovel it. So how do you deal with that? So you'll meet people. I never make this recommendation to people, never. Um, so that's why I'm saying it for something to the 50 of you and record it for who else to listen to it. But I never recommend to people to fully tovel something and then just let it dry out and hope for the best. Uh, there are definitely people who recommend that I'm not one of them. Um, what some people recommend is some people recommend to essentially create the vessel anew under Jewish ownership, which would basically mean um, to tinker maybe with the electric application of it in some way, sort of render it unfit for use and then fix it. And so then you sort of fixed it as a vessel under Jewish ownership. So, so you know, it's sort of the equivalent of if you made a vessel for yourself. So that's sort of like a workaround. The most, I think the most common thing done today, and this is what I recommend to people, is to basically bifurcate this and say the electric component of the appliance does not have to go in the water. And the part of the appliance that comes in direct contact with uh, the food or drink should go in the water. So if you think of a water urn, what you would essentially do is you kind of hold the urn upside down and, and, and like, you know, kind of hold the base, you know, and, and the plug, et cetera, out of the water. And then as best you can, put the part of the urn that actually holds the water inside. Now, when I tell people about this, I add one point, which I think is significant, which is, and remember that worse comes to worse, if you don't tovel it as well as you want it to, there's an opinion that holds you don't have to tovel it anyway. So my recommendation to people is make sure to keep the electric part out of the water air to the side of making sure the electric part is out of the water. And then however much of the vessel that comes in contact with the water 
that you're able to get inside, the more the better. But but uh, don't don't allow yourself uh, anguish if you didn't tovel as much of it as you would like. Um, I I should also mention that when I give this recommendation to people, I recommend to them to not make a bracha on the toveling. Uh, first of all, there's a question if you need to tovel it altogether. But besides that, this toveling seems like somewhat of an imperfect toveling, to be honest with you. And many times to say you're going to get it perfectly done is probably not so accurate if you're going to try to keep the electric part out of the water. So make sure to keep the electric part out of the water. And then however much more of the vessel that comes in contact with the food or drink that you're able to get in the water, you should try to do so. Okay. Um, totally new uh, point. What's the story with aluminum foil pans? What, what's the story with those? I mean, they are, they are made from a, a, a metal, you know, a, it's a metal item, you know, in some sense. Now, in general, we're lenient regarding, um, regarding disposables. Generally speaking, things that are by nature one use, we generally say they don't have to be toveled. Okay, that's a pretty accepted, pretty accepted statement. Um, I want to be clear about something. I, I hear people talk about this, and I think it's a misunderstanding. People transfer that to say that you can always use something once before toveling it. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that. Uh, I, if it's if it's a cleave, if it's a substantive vessel, you need to tovel it before using it even once. But if it's a vessel which by nature you only use one time, that's not considered a substantive vessel in the first place, and therefore you don't have to tovel it. So that's pretty accepted for a one and done um, item. What's interesting is these aluminum foil pans, um, some of us use it once and then are done with it. If you use it once and you're done with it, I, I, I really think it's pretty accepted. You don't have to tovel it. Um, if you use it, regularly two or three times before uh, disposing of it. What I mean by using it is, let's say you, you know, you cook with it, let's say two or three times. I don't mean that you, you've you had leftovers that you've used at three meals and you've kept it in the pan the whole time. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, if you use it two or three times, then a Moshe finds this a tshuva that you should really be toveling it because then it's more, it's a more substantive vessel. Um, to the best of my knowledge, the common approach with toveling aluminum foil pans is again, if you're gonna use it two or three times, you should tovel it the first, you know, before using it the first time. But I think the more common thing is not to make a bracha on it when you tovel it. But if you really only expect to use it once, the, the common thing is to not tovel it at all. Okay. Um, so this is a good segue to the next question. Snapple bottle. So Snapple bottle is made out of glass. Right? Glass bottles should be toveled. You buy a Snapple and you drink it. Do you have to tovel the bottle when you're drinking the Snapple? You don't have to. Uh, you can make the argument that it's intended as a one-time use. Right? And we just said before that, you know, the aluminum foil pans that you're only going to use once, you don't have to tovel it before you use it. So Snapple bottles the same. But some people wash out the Snapple bottle and keep on using it a second time, a third time, a fourth time. So what's the story? Do you have to tovel it before using it the second time? Everyone everyone, catch the question? Do you need to tovel it? So I get it that you don't, it's being sold as a one-time use, I get it. So, but once it's empty and now you're gonna wash it out and use it to, you know, to bring water with you, whatever it is, do you need to tovel it before using it that second time? So the generally accepted thing is not. Uh, Hashem, I remember discussing this with I asked him, why not? So his argument to me was that, similar to what we were talking about earlier this evening, you're essentially redefining the use of this Snapple bottle. In other words, if you, if you would ask the manufacturers of Snapple, how many times do you expect the, 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 your, your customers to use the bottle? You know, my guess is their assumption would be that you just use the bottle once. So by you deciding you're going to wash it out and use it multiple times, you've sort of redefined the vessel. And then you have to redefine the vessel under your own ownership. 
So it's like you recreated it, so to say, under Jewish ownership. So that, that's the rationale he said. But like I said, I think the pretty accepted thing for all these types of utensils that are sold as a one-time thing, um, it seems pretty accepted that if you end up using it more often, you don't have to tovel it. Okay, China. Uh, China, you get different opinions about. Um, so I want to explain what what the uh, what the dynamic is about China. So China is earthenware with a glaze of glass, right? Now earthenware is is not obligated in toveling. You don't have to tovel, uh, you know, clay. You, you, that doesn't have to be toveled. Glass does have to be toveled. So the question is. How substantively do you view the glaze of the glass? Do you see it as, as, as sort of a, a core component of the vessel so that the, the food that you're serving on your china is being served on glass? Or do you see it as sort of just a light layer on top of the, the, the earthenware vessel? So you get different opinions about it. Rabbi Einar Sechon of Racha felt that china does not have to be toveled. Uh, so I tell you know, but m- many opinions do say China has to be toveled. Uh, uh, I, I think many of the opinions. Well, I, I when people ask me, I tell them China doesn't have to be toveled, but it's it's uh, you definitely get different opinions about it. Uh, hard plastic items, I would say, should be toveled. Um, hard plastic items, uh, generally speaking, we say just to shift over to kashering for a moment. Um, Generally speaking, we say that if a plastic item was exposed to non-kosher, you can't kosher plastic. You mean you're not able to kosher plastic. That's the general thing. So I would say that for hard plastic as well. Okay. Um, it's a big question. Shifting over to kosher. China or other metal items that haven't been used in several years, can they be koshered for Pesach? Um, you, you you do get different approaches about this. Uh, my my understanding is that we're very machmir about absorption of uh, of earthenware. We're very machmir about it. Very machmir about not being able to appropriately purge it. Um, we're certainly very machmir about Pesach. So if someone were to ask me. That they had a set of china they wanted to cash for Pesach, I would say they couldn't. That would be my personal opinion. I'm, I'm sure there are others. I'm sure you get a wide gamut of opinions. I would say they couldn't. Um, there's a very famous chufa from Moshe Feinstein about. Uh, uh, I, I, I want to quote the context of the chufa that I'm aware of. Maybe there's another chufa that I'm not aware of, but I'm only aware of one chufa from Moshe Feinstein Spanner. People quote it a lot, but I think they're really shifting the context. Now, I want to be very clear. There's all kinds of opinions out there. I don't mean that what I'm about to say is the only view. I just want to explain at least where I'm coming from. Ramosha Feinstein has a leniency for a couple that became Bali Chuva, and they had this set of China that they had used in a non-kosher setting because they didn't use to keep kosher. And so then the question is, are they allowed to cash with China or are they going to never have a set of China or are they going to have to buy themselves a whole new set of China? He's not talking about Pesach, by the way. He's talking about regular year-round use. It, he does come up with a very uh, novel leniency. Yeah, I think in certain circumstances is, is, is reasonable to apply. But if somebody says, well, Ramosha finds the holds it's no problem to cash with China, that's not, I, that's not an appropriate uh rendition of the tshuva, in my opinion. Uh, it could be that there are unique circumstances in a lot of cases, but I, I would not say China can be kashered for Pesach. That would be my opinion. Um, okay. This is an interesting question. What's the story with switching vessels from flashings to milkings and vice versa? What's the story with that? Um, we know there's a concept of kashering. We know that. Uh, we know that if I mess up in my kitchen and I render something not kosher, I can kosher it and fix it and make it kosher. So let's say I have uh, 
set of cutlery that I use for fleshings. And then, I don't know, I want to upgrade, you know, when I got a, I got a nicer set of cutlery. And so now I want to take this cutlery and shift it over to milkings. So the basic halacha is that we're not allowed to kasher from fleshings to milkings and milkings to fleshings. That's the basic halacha. Um, the reason why that's the basic halacha is uh, the rabbis were very concerned that people would get all mixed up, uh, which I'm sure we can imagine that, you know, what's milkings, what's fleshings. I can't tell you how many questions I get over the course of a year that start with rabbi. I thought I knew what was mochings and fleshings in my cabinet, you know, in my storage closet. And then I got all, you know, for a plunge, I got all mixed up. So the general halach is you're not supposed to cash your back and forth between fleshings and milchings. Um, There are exceptions. Um, there are varying opinions about these exceptions, but some of the classic opinions are here, this is said, if it wasn't used for a year. Let's say you didn't use it for a whole year. Now, we're talking about materials that are able to be kashered, but the only problem is that you're allowed to kasher from milkings to fleshings to fleshings to milkings. So on that front, if you didn't use it for a year, you could kasher it. Um, there's another idea that uh, someone gave it to you as a gift. You know, it's a hand-me-down. So the rabbis were worried about people shifting back and forth, flesh to milk, milk to flesh. If it's that you used it for flesh, now you give it to me as a gift. This is a one-time transfer. That's very. That's a very different scenario for me to cash it. But the most famous, the most famous one, hands down, is Pesach. You're certainly allowed to cash her for Pesach. In other words, if you have uh, cutlery, whatever different utensils in the kitchen that you want to cash her. To, so, you know, to purge them of their chametz so you can use them for Pesach. So once you're allowed to cash for Pesach, you're allowed to cash from fleshings to milchings and milchings to fleshings as well. So if you have cutlery that you'd like to shift over to milchings, really the trick is, the, without a doubt, acceptable in halacha, cash it for Pesach, and then on Pesach, use it for milchings. And then after that, decide. Maybe you want to keep it for Pesach. Maybe you want to use it for the rest of the year. But once you cash it, then it's like a, a, a blank slate. Um, if it became non-kosher, or it's, let's say you had a fleshig's uh, a pot and it became non-kosher. You messed up. It became non-kosher. So you have to cash it. Again, once you cash it, it's a clean slate. So now you can start using it for milk eggs. But uh, it's not suggested to make your 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 kitchen utensils, not kosher. That's not, uh, it's not suggested. But if it happened, you could switch over. Okay, uh, this is an interesting question. You know, we're normally pretty strict about glass. The Sephardim are more lenient. Ashkenazim are normally pretty strict about glass out of concern that if a glass absorbs something in heat, we're normally concerned that you can't effectively purge it. Um, so are you allowed to buy Drinking glass, drinking glasses, or a cake serving plate at a yard sale. So the assumption at the yard sale is that they don't they don't keep kosher. That's that's the assumption. Um, now I, I I assume the the question I assume the questioner is asking this specific question because they're taking on as a given that if it was a type of utensil that you use hot you know, you couldn't be getting it because you can't, we don't normally cash your glass. But they're saying, well, it's something that you only use cold anyway. So if you only use it cold anyway, would there really be such an absorption in the first place? Um, so when people ask me that, I, I personally tell people, I'm sure there are different opinions about this, but I, I, I personally tell people that if it's the type of thing that, that is normal when you're cleaning it to clean it, you know, in very hot water or the dishwasher or whatever it is, and you're going to clean it that way, and it's very possible that the previous users cleaned it that way, I, I, I would be wary because the bottom line is that means that it had all this exposure to food and drink with its previous users in heat, not kosher. And now you're going to be exposing it in your own kitchen at high heat to other things. I, so I personally would discourage it, but I could certainly imagine people having uh, different opinions. Okay, uh, I hope this was clear. That that's, to the best of my knowledge, that's the list of questions that were submitted. Uh, uh, some questions I kind of uh, streamlined and combined. Okay, there have been a number of chats that come in. I'm gonna start off by going through the chats. 
uh, people can feel free to submit more in the chat as we go along. Yes, that is a great, great question. The question posed was, uh, does a wine decanter need to be toveled? So I want to revisit the broader principle uh, that, we, uh, that we began with. Vessels that are used for cooking, you know, if they're of the certain materials that we discussed, need to be toveled, they need to be toveled with the bracha. Vessels that are used for eating, if they're of the materials that we discussed, need to be toveled and toveled with the bracha. What about vessels that are used, whether it be they're used for storage, whether it be they're used for serving? I would also put, you know, I mean, a wine decanter is, you know, you're pouring from the decanter into your cups. Um, I personally would say a wine decanter should be toveled, but without a bracha. You know, it's sort of like a secondary level use. That's what I personally would say. Thank you for that. Okay, um, so someone posed a very good question. I had spoken about the issue that you can't, you're not supposed to tovel things for someone. Um, you're not supposed to tovel things to give as a gift. You know, it's, you're, to, you're supposed to be toveling things for your own use. But then I spoke about being a proxy for someone else. So I, I think it's true that you can acquire something for someone else, but the idea of appointing myself without the person's appointment to tovel it on their behalf, I feel like you're still just toveling it for them. I think it needs, I think it needs to be that they tell you to tovel. That's my understanding. I, I appreciate the question. Um, I don't think running the, I suppose that's a reference to an oven rack. I don't think running the self-clean cycle makes it like new. I don't think so. Thank you. I'm trying to understand this question. Can a pan be filled with water and soap? Oh. Wait. Okay, I think what this question is, is let's say a person, let's say a person has a pan that they haven't toveled yet. Before toveling it, may they soak other utensils in it? I think that's the question. Uh, I see the questioner. Could you just give me a quick yes or no look? Did I understand the question correctly? Okay, I don't know. Um, okay, I hope I understand the question. I think that would be okay. I hope I'm understanding your question correctly. Um, okay. Um, Okay, uh, I think the question, I got a question in how is it different than foil pans? I suppose that was a reference to my Snapple discussion. So I, I think it's different. I mean, I hear, I hear the question. I, I think with Snapple, I think the fact that it's being sold as the thing, the, the, the bottle is being sold as the thing that holds the drink. And the assumption is that once I've drunk the drink, I'm done with the bottle. The pan is being sold as a vessel, and it's possible the person will use it numerous times. So I think that's the difference. Okay, wait, I'm trying to understand this next question. Um, if you're cooking twice in the same pan, if you're cooking a, a double portion of food twice in the same pan, I think that counts as two times. That's what I would say. Thank you. Okay, Ariel, you posed a very important question. I'm sure you're not the only one, okay? I wanna be very clear about this. If a person got a microwave from a non-Jew who's used it, there are two different there are two different fronts. One is toveling a vessel owned by a non-Jew. The other is, oh, it has absorption of non-kosher food. I have to kosher it. Those are two different things. Um, now, I think what, I, I, it, so normally we kosher it before we tovel it, you know, if it was used by a non-Jew. But if I remember correctly, if you flip the order, the tefillah still works. 
I think that's what you're asking, if I remember correctly. Okay, thank you very much, Julie. That's an important question. How does one kasher a very large pot? Okay, um, first of all, well, okay. How does one kasher a very large pot? So first of all, the classic way to kasher a pot, not all vessels are the same, but the classic way to kasher a pot is to expose it to boiling water. Now, if you have a small pot, so what you do is you make sure the pot is clean. You make sure a very large pot is clean. You make sure neither pot has been used in the, in the preceding 24 hours. You fill the very large pot with water. You bring the very large pot with the water into a boil, and then you completely immerse the smaller pot within the large pot. I want to be very clear about this. I know this isn't even what you're asking. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page leading up to it. Um, I want to be very clear about this. When it comes to kashering with boiling water, the entirety of the vessel needs to be exposed to the boiling water, but it doesn't all need to be exposed at the same time. When it comes to immersing in a mikvah, the entire vessel needs to be in the mikvah at the same time. So it's different. But now going on to Julie's question. So you have a very large pot. It's not going to fit in another pot. So now what do you do? So the common approach is as follows. You make sure the pot is clean. You wait 24 hours since the last time it was used. You fill it with water. You bring it to a boil. And then while it's sitting on the burner and the water has come to a boil and it's bubbling, you take a kettle that also has boiling water in it and you pour the boiling water of the kettle into the large pot until it overflows. And that's the, that's the traditional way to, uh, to cash a very large pot. I should also mention the minog with all of these things is to wash them with cold water after the cash rate. Michael, that's an interesting question. Um, I would say a nonstick metal pan does need to be toveled. I, I appreciate where the question is coming from. Um, I, I, there's a lot of discussion about this. It really cuts both ways. Uh, sometimes it cuts as a kula, sometimes it cuts as a khumra, but I think of the nonstick substance as being um, very much secondary to the core of the of the pan. So I, I would say that the, the pan needs to be uh, tovel. Thank you. Okay, Rivka, I'm sure your, your follow-up is responding to something I said in response to the question about I'm not understanding. You're welcome to follow up again. Yes, thank you, Sigla. Um, um, this is an important point. It's fine for anyone in the household to total an item. In other words, it doesn't have to be like the owner of the, in other words, that much is okay. Uh, but presumably it should be, I guess on some level it makes sense for the head of household to ask the person to total it. I, I think so, probably. But anybody can total it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Gila, so generally speaking, the thing with soaking the glassware for three days, changing the water each day, is when glassware was used for cold, primarily for cold, but we still want to kosher it. Um, so generally speaking, this thing about the soaking with the water three days, for Ashkenazim wouldn't be good if the glass was used hot. The most common thing is glassware for Pesach, where we have this unique level of stringency. That's, I believe, where the, where the, uh, uh, where the three days of the soaking comes into play. Someone put in a question, if you line a disposable aluminum foil pan with a piece of foil, I, I, I don't, to the best of my understanding, that doesn't, that's not a, 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 a changing factor in terms of the aluminum foil pan. In other words, if a person was going to use the pan multiple times, even if they were going to use a foil piece on the inside, I would still tell them to tovel it. Thank you. What a good question. Thank you very much. You want to give a gift to a Jew who, who doesn't know from toveling. So here it is, I'm saying, if you give a gift to someone, don't tovel it first. If you're giving a gift to someone who's not gonna tovel it, I would say it's a big, big mitzvah to tovel it first. Thank you for raising that question. Yes, thank you very much. No, you're not allowed to tovel a large object in sections. 
kashering a large object in such as you can. Tovaling, that's just halacha. It all has to be immersed at one time. I'm, I'm trying to read this last chat. Okay, I, I, okay. I, I think what this last question is is as follows. I bought an aluminum foil pan. I didn't tovel it. I cook with it once, and then after I cook with it, um, after I cooked with it, I want to soak other utensils in that. Does that count as a second time use? I think that's the question. I would not count that as a second time use. I would count for the uses the actual time you're cooking in an oven or whatever. Uh, an enamel roasted pan, thank you for that question. I would treat it as a metal pan in terms of tofu. That's what I would think. Okay. Um, I think we've gotten through all the chats. Any other questions? You're welcome to call out questions now if you'd like. Okay. Um, does anybody... Does anybody want to submit in the chat a request for a, a, a topic next time? Um, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, you're also certainly welcome to contact myself or Miriam as well. Um, last call for questions or comments, whether chat or calling it out. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for staying with us. I want to say, I see from the numbers, this was certainly a topic that people were interested in. I'm pretty confident this was absolutely Miriam's idea. So thank you very much, Miriam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you, Rabbi. Okay, good night, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.